changing the economy democratically. A different economy is possible. This is the economy for the common good. Many men are outraged. Why do women want the same rights as all people? For tens of thousands of years, men have successfully oppressed women. That's why the women's demand for equal rights for many men now comes somewhat suddenly. Here are the most glaring facts. 69% of the members of the German parliament are men. 80% of the experts on German television are men. 92% of all mayors in Germany are men. So, from my perspective, it looks like equality. In addition, women earn less and receive only half the pension. The amazing thing is that women are not generally disadvantaged, only when it comes to power. The majority of all high school graduates and students are women. But the higher you get in a hierarchy, the fewer women there are. It's not impossible that women will get to the top, but the higher the air, the thinner it becomes. Why is that? Science says, people hire people who are similar. This does not have to be active discrimination, it is an unconscious process. The board of Bayern Munich Football Club does not hire Dortmund fans. Men rarely women. Why are there still people who are against the women's quota? Well, because the women's quota puts women at a disadvantage. What? Women are all the more disadvantaged because the women's quota makes it clear that women are disadvantaged? Those who believe this also say in the case of a burning house, I should not draw the resident's attention to the fact that their house is on fire, otherwise they feel discriminated against as victims of fire. Well, against the women's quota speaks that it just discriminates against men. The women's quota does not discriminate against men. It only ends the discrimination of women. 88% of board members of companies at the German stock index DAX are men. In 2015, fewer women were on MDAX boards than men with the names Thomas and Andreas. Let's take a look on a baboon rock and put it simply. 9 out of 10 baboons are male at the top of the German economy. And that despite the fact that many more females work on the baboon rock. Well, suggestion. How about an upper limit for men instead of quotas for women? An upper limit for men makes sense not only because competent women finally get the positions they deserve, but also because less incompetent men end up in management positions. Yes, but the quota of women restricts the freedom of business. And that's true. When baboon males throw baboon females off the rock all the time and the baboon police intervenes, it restricts the males in their freedom. 97% of the companies surveyed reject a legal quota for women. Men-led companies being against women's quotas? I was surprised. I also found it surprising that 100% of all kings in history were critical of the introduction of democracy. One's freedom is always the restriction of the other. When I have the freedom in my relationship to sleep late, my girlfriend's freedom is restricted because she cannot practice drums. When my girlfriend takes the freedom of practicing drums, I cannot sleep late. That was a sad example, because I don't have a relationship. After all, I can sleep late. 
I once tore my ligaments when I got up and had to walk on crutches afterwards. Crutches are shit. But compared to falling over, crutches are cool. The women's quota is no fun, but it gives women the power they deserve. It should be introduced everywhere. Simply out of love. Yes, simply out of love, we should introduce the women's quota and equal rights for women and men in the economy, as the cabaret artist Nico Semsrott has just suggested. That would be something, wouldn't it? I just think it would be fair. For example, the women's quota in the German parliament is just 30.7%, as low as it was 20 years ago. If the legislator were to actually reflect the entire population, 140 additional women would have to sit in the Bundestag. In the executive branch, things do not look much better. In the ministries, the proportion of women is only 35.3%. A similar situation can be seen in the economy. Only a quarter of the board members of listed companies are women. Hello, dear listeners. We, Reinhard Schwarz and Andrea Beam, warmly welcome you to our radio program of the Economy for the Common Good and are delighted that you join us. You already heard it. In today's program, we deal with the topic of gender justice and ask, how far have we come today in achieving equal rights for women and men in the economy? In a moment, we'll talk about this to social anthropologist Andrea Vetter from the NGO Laboratory for New Economic Ideas. We will also take a closer look at a company that has joined the economy for the common good, namely the sports goods manufacturer VD. We went to Tetnang in southern Germany and asked managing director Antje von Dewitz and sustainability manager Jan Leuch how VD lives gender equality within the company and in its global supply chain. But let's get back again to a few numbers. From 1st January to 18 March, women in Germany worked without payment, that means for 77 days. I guess you now want to draw our attention to the so-called equal pay day. Yes, exactly. Because this day clearly shows that women still earn considerably less per hour on average than men. Measured by the man's annual income, until 18 March, women worked without payment. Unfortunately, there is still too little progress in adjusting wages. According to the German Federal Statistical Office, in 2018, a woman earned an average of 17 euros gross per hour, while a man earned 21 euros and 60 cents per hour. Women thus earn 21% less than men. There are only two countries in the European Union where the gender pay gap is larger, Estonia and the Czech Republic. The average gender pay gap in the European Union is 16%. About two-thirds of this gender pay gap can be explained by the fact that women are more likely to work part-time and in social professions with lower income, and they less often become supervisors. The remaining 7% of the gender pay gap is simply based on conscious or unconscious discrimination with fatal consequences. Retired women receive 46.5% less pension than retired men. This also puts Germany far above the European Union average of 40.2%. Only in Cyprus the pension gap is larger. According to the Gender Gap Report of the World Economic Forum, it would take as much as 202 years to reach gender equality in the economy if we were to continue with the alignment as slowly as before. And even in the movement of the economy for the common good itself, we are still far from real equality. A glance at the figures reveals the following picture. The German regional groups are coordinated by 31 women and 80 men. 
The International Coordination Team, a leading committee within the ECG, is currently staffed with zero women and three men. One woman and five men work in the International Management Team. As employees or freelancers, six women and 12 men work for the ECG, of which 100% of the management positions are held by men. These are the pure figures. And how does the actual participation of women in the working groups and hubs look like? Is it really true, as sociologists at Princeton University found out, that men in larger groups speak more often and that the average speaking time of a woman decreases by a quarter to a third if there are more men than women in a group? A female ECG activist made the effort to measure with a stopwatch at a regional group meeting in which three women and 11 men participated. The five speech contributions of the women lasted an average of seven seconds, whereas the many men's speeches lasted on average 45 seconds. This small measurement alone illustrates how traditional and rigid patterns of behavior persist. We now talk to Andrea Vetter about deadlocked patterns and new approaches to overcoming them. Herzlich willkommen in der Sendung, Andrea Vetter. Ja, hallo, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Sehr gerne. Andrea Vetter, Sie schreiben, forschen, erzählen. Welcome to the radio show, Andrea. Hello, many thanks for your invitation. Andrea, you do research, you talk and write about social ecological change, you organize discussions and events, and you even bake cheesecake for social ecological change, especially for the NGO called Concept Work New Economy. And you publish in the magazine Oya, Enkeltauglich Leben, which means lead a sustainable grandchild-friendly life. As a social anthropologist, you are particularly interested in convivial technology, old and new eco-feminist ideas, common goods and successful patterns of self-organization. Your NGO, Concept Werk Neue Ökonomie, was founded in Leipzig in 2011. About 15 people work there to create perspectives for a social, ecological and democratic economy that focuses on people's needs and respects nature. The NGO aims to change thinking patterns, lifestyles and political conditions in the economy, for example by forging alliances with social movements that already today present alternative forms of economy and life which could serve as starting points for a transformation. Andrea, statistically, so-called women's jobs are rather caring jobs, and men's jobs rather manual or technical jobs, which is sometimes explained with alleged genetic or physical differences between women and men. But work in the men-dominated IT sector, for example, does not require muscles. However, those, mainly women, who lift old and sick people in old people's homes and hospitals should have muscles and should be strong. Why is the work of women today still considered as less valuable and is not paid fairly. There are historical reasons for that. One of them was that after the Second World War, men were paid the family wage. The ideal was that the woman would stay at home and look after the children or old and sick relatives. The man would go to work and his wage would be enough for the whole family. The wage of the woman instead, if she was working for money, was always an extra wage, which supplemented the family's income. In former times, a woman was not the one who fed the family alone. 
This is also one of the reasons why so many women raising their children alone live in poverty. In Germany, more than 60% of them live below the poverty line because women's wages are not designed as family salaries at all. In addition, typical jobs of women, like for example the nursing profession, were not paid at all until 100 years ago. That was volunteer work for nuns, who provided their work without getting paid. And during the time between the two world wars, for example, female teachers were dismissed when they got married. Today, for example, IT professions, when they first came up, were regarded as women's work, much like secretaries. They were many female programmers who laid the foundations of today's IT, which changed when it became a more lucrative profession. And of course, it also has to do with the fact that, on average, women organize themselves much less in labor unions than men due to lack of time, due to double and triple workload, due to much more care work and due to difficulties to organize oneself in the care work sector. For example, it is more difficult to go on strike in a daycare center for children than to strike a machine. And yet we see that a lot is changing, for example, with the big strikes in daycare centers in recent years, or with the women's strike on the 8th of March, where women called for laying down paid and unpaid work. If all the unpaid care work women do worldwide today were provided by a single company, that company would have an annual income of 10 trillion dollars and it would be 43 times more profitable than Apple. This gender care gap is rarely discussed. Why isn't there more awareness of this? My feeling is that this is currently changing in society. For example, our NGO is working very closely with the Care Revolution Network. And this network's goal is precisely to address the gender care gap and other issues related to care work in order to ensure a more gender fair distribution of care work. I already have the impression that a lot is moving in society. For example, there is a new image of being a father, which spreads the idea that fathers should also take more care of their children. There is a greater acceptance that fathers should also take parental leave, although the figures show, of course, that there is still a lot of room for improvement. However, I think a start has been made. Another women's network, the so-called Network for Caring Economy, working on the subject of care work for over 25 years, makes it clear that not only the women's care work, but also the productive work of nature does not enjoy the appreciation it should enjoy, because both are seen as just free services, instead as necessary work for the maintenance of life. Just like the apple tree that grows anyway, the woman that waters the tree anyway, and the apples that grow by themselves, and the woman that bakes the apple pie anyway. All this is free of cost that happens anyway. And we do not have to pay any further attention to it, so that productive work, that means paid work, can be done elsewhere. In their widely acclaimed book, Imperial Lifestyle, Ulrich Brandt and Markus Wissen point out that, quote, the andro- and eurocentric design of life of a hegemonic masculinity is an integral part of our imperial way of life, end of quote. A transformation of our imperial way of life must therefore begin with the hegemonic norms of masculinity. But how come that, for example, in the post-growth movement, the topic of masculinity is so rarely addressed? And what shall we do to make this core topic of capitalism more prominent? I have the feeling that, especially in the post-growth discussion, the topic is actually not so rarely addressed. In recent years, there have been a number of discussions about this, sometimes explicitly, 
and sometimes in a rather hidden way. That this is not so much noticed might have to do with the fact that there are some prominent male representatives of post-growth ideas who are invited everywhere and who are quoted over and over again. But all the ideas on post-growth that have been put forward for 30 or 40 years by women's organizations are being presented again by men speaking little about masculinity but get the floor everywhere. There's a huge debate beyond the two or three prominent representatives dealing intensively with this gender topic. Women or feminists have already drawn our attention to the common ground of the devaluation of the productivity of nature and the devaluation of reproductive work of women. These two devaluations we have to think together because they are constitutive for our current economic system, which lives from exploiting exactly these two devalued ways of work. That is why I would say that if we are really serious about a post-growth economy, we have to turn today's economy from its head to its feet. We have to focus on the vital activities that are traditionally performed by women in many parts of the world today. A caring masculinity or another male image is also very important for achieving a just society in which human beings can develop. This is also the goal of a post-growth society, that development and freedom is not only possible for those who happen to belong to the upper 10,000, but that all human beings worldwide have the possibility to live up to their abilities and needs, no matter which gender they have. So there is still a lot to do, and we need to work for this change. Dear Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show. Goodbye and greetings to Berlin. müssen, aber vielen, vielen Dank, dass Sie in der Sendung waren. Schöne Grüße nach Berlin. Danke schön nochmal. Vielen Dank, Andrea Vetter. Tschüss. Herzlichen Dank. Tschüss. Impulse. A woman who thinks she enjoys equal rights should go through a pedestrian zone without runaround men. Says Maria Versig, president of the German Women's Lawyers Association. On 8 March, the International Women's Day, we went to Tetnang near Lake Constance and visited the sporting goods manufacturer VD. The company had presented its third common good balance sheet and this with a remarkable result. Out of a total of 1,000 possible points, the company achieved 631. Faudi was founded in 1974 and is now 100% family owned by the second generation. It develops, produces and sells outdoor equipment, for example, functional outdoor clothing, backpacks and bags, sleeping bags, tents, shoes and camping supplies. 529 people work at the company's climate-neutral headquarters on Lake Constance. About two-thirds of them are women. Each year, in the company's own factory, around 180,000 wheelbags for bicycle and backpacks are produced by 49 employees from 18 nations. Impulse Information from a recent study by the German Institute for Economic Research. Cooking, cleaning and washing clothes take women two hours a day. Men, 52 minutes. When visiting Faudi, we were particularly interested in how the company implements gender equality both locally and in its international supply chain. At the company's German headquarters, 40% of management positions are filled by women. There are not only flexible working hours, but also an in-house children's home with childcare, 
from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and it is common for men to take parental leave for several months. So it's no wonder that the number of employees' children has tripled since 2000 due to the good reconciling of work and family life. And perhaps also because of the organic cafeteria, where we also enjoyed a tasty meal. Employees also stay longer in the company. The fluctuation rate is low. Although VOD has now relocated around 15% of its production back to Europe, to Germany, to Portugal and to Lithuania, it still produces mainly in Asia, like most textile companies. In Vietnam, China, Myanmar and Cambodia, it cooperates with over 60 production sites where products made from sustainable materials have been produced in an environmentally friendly manner since 2001. Last year, the first collection of 90 bio-based, recycled and natural materials was launched. VOD also promotes the right of customers to get their purchased goods repaired. For this purpose, VOD cooperates with the repair platform iFixit and has also set up an upcycling workshop in Tetnang, where 12 employees, in this case integrated refugees, manufacture new products from leftover materials. But what about the equal rights and working conditions of the many Asian seamstresses? In 2010, Faudi joined the non-profit organization Fairware Foundation and since then has been screened and certified by local independent NGOs and trade unions. For example, it is checked whether employment contracts have been properly concluded and whether employees are covered by social insurance. A company code of conduct also obliges VOD to take responsibility for ensuring that the highest labor law standards apply throughout its supply chain. We spoke with Antje von Dewitz, VOD's managing director, who is also clearly in favor of a women's quota, about sexual harassment at the workplace and about the question of salaries, which is very important for Asian employees. In the textile industry in which VOD operates, production takes place in Asia. The situation of women there is very different from the situation here in Germany. How do you see the situation of women in your supply chain? Also 80 Prozent etwa machen wir in Asien und da würde ich sagen, dass wiederum mindestens 80 Prozent alles Frauen sind, also näheren sind überwiegend Frauen. Indeed, 80% of our production is in Asia, and I would say that at least 80% of the textile workers are women. Seamstresses are mostly women. All our production sites are audited by Fairware Foundation and also accompanied by our own team throughout the year. The audits explicitly cover the critical issue of sexual harassment. As far as I know, we have no complaints in this area. Issues that concern us more are overtime work and wages, of course. In China, about 2,700 people work for you in subcontractors' facilities. A relatively large number of them are men in management positions. Twice as many men are in management positions than women in relation to the male-female ratio in subcontractors' facilities. Is it possible for VOD, maybe through Fairware Foundation, to influence this ratio and to give new impulses to these culturally ingrained gender structures and patterns? Or is this issue simply too far away because you do not provide development aid but operate as a commercial enterprise. Well, that's not the focus. There are other burning issues we focus on, like why are there so many overtime working hours? What is the wage structure? What part does VOD play in it? And how can we contribute to higher wages? These are topics that are our current issues. The topic of women in management position is not really one that we focus on. 
But in general, the situation of women at work, for example their safety and health, is a very big issue, not only here at your German factory in Tetnang, but also in Asia. In the VD statistics provided by Fairware Foundation very transparently, we discovered quite a lot of difficult working situations in 47 contracting companies in Vietnam and in 10 companies in China. Fairware Foundation takes a very close look at this. But how are you, sitting far away in Germany, how are you aware of the situation in Asia? That is part of the audit. You have to imagine it like this. Once a year there is an audit. Then there is a report. How is this report created? It is created by looking at the working site, by looking at the books, by conducting interviews with managers and employees at the site, and also with anonymous interview partners. So the content of such a report is very broad. Then the report is sent to the company and to us. Violations of the law must be changed immediately, and weak points must be addressed. We have to prove, or rather the contracting company has to prove, that these issues are addressed. But in the end, we are responsible for the contracting company addressing these issues. For example, as far as health and safety at work is concerned, training must be provided to ensure that regulations are complied with. We have a large team in Asia. We have five VD employees in Vietnam and five in China who work continuously with the contracting companies on these reports and help to address weak points. Due diligence and the respect of human rights in the supply chain is very much our concern and we try to be very quick in remedying critical situations. That means you more or less rely on the expertise of Fairware Foundation in the social field, for example. As for the audits made by Fairware Foundation, yes, they are objective. We do not want to audit ourselves, we want to be audited by a third party. And we are audited every year. We are rated on how well we respect human rights in our supply chain, how well we follow up on open issues, how well we set up our internal procedures and responsibilities, how seriously we take our issues and how we get on with difficult issues. We have the leader status within Fairware Foundation's ranking and the best rating of all companies. You received 94 out of 100 points to be awarded. Yes, we take corporate social responsibility very seriously. We have a lot of employees dealing with this issue and we are also advancing this topic. How is your proactive approach received by the customers? Do you have any experience on that? Does your commitment really raise the awareness of the consumers in Germany? Do they appreciate your efforts by also paying a higher price for your products? First question, yes. Second question, so-so. I notice that people around the world are becoming more and more aware that their consumption has an impact on global challenges, that they have a concrete influence and are often the cause of global challenges. People are becoming more and more aware and wish to shop and consume with a good conscience. This attitude is increasing. But there is a gap between the willingness to consume in a sustainable way and to pay more for sustainable products. There is still a long way to go. You are not only a commercial enterprise, but you also want to change something politically. You are member in various alliances, including the so-called Textile Alliance, a round table where 130 representatives from five stakeholder groups come together and work to achieve social, ecological and economic improvements along the entire textile supply chain. What do you hope as a result from the alliance? Do you experience solidarity among the companies? In this alliance, one thing becomes very clear. It is very difficult to achieve good standards and solutions in a democratic discourse, simply because the interests of the involved stakeholders are so different. 
About 50% of the players in the clothing industry are involved in this alliance, but 50% are not. Many member companies do not want standards to be set too high, because that would mean a competitive disadvantage for them, which the other 50% would not face. Others want binding legal standards for all, so that all companies would operate under the same conditions. Some eco-clothing suppliers feel uncomfortable sitting next to Kick and Lidl in this alliance. They fear standards could be weakened, which would only worsen their position. To reconcile the two positions is difficult, but also exciting. I really find this process great and remarkable, because since I have been committed to sustainability, my demand was always that we need political solutions, we need legal frameworks and we need impulses. What is also exciting for me is that Minister Müller from the Christian Social Union Party presiding this alliance is very passionate about the whole process. He has now presented a draft of a new due diligence act. What do you think of it? In my opinion, it's great, because that would require to create a legal basis that obliges all companies to comply with legal principles. Ecological and social responsibility would be an integral part in the supply chain. Everything that we are doing today voluntarily would then be mandatory for everyone. Creating an equal level playing field instead of maintaining today's unfair competitive conditions would be a huge step forward. And to advance the issue of due diligence in supply chains at all, that would be a huge step forward also. But are mandatory legal standards the only way to safeguard human rights in business or is there another way, the way of voluntary compliance with human rights? Currently the government examines the voluntary compliance by the companies. At the moment a survey of large companies is conducted. By the end of 2019 it will be evaluated as to whether sufficient responsibility and due diligence are already respected in the supply chain voluntarily. It will then be decided whether due diligence will be law or not. I would much prefer a law because the information in the survey is also voluntary. I have no idea how valid the information given by the companies actually is. Nowhere, not even in the constitutions, it is stipulated that the economy should serve profit, but the economy should serve the common good. Property should be used for the common good. We should ask ourselves to what extent is that the case, to what extent is our economy serving the benefit of individuals at the expense of others. Such a stance, I think, is taken by those who know too little of the consequences of economic activity, of the disadvantage for other people and for the environment. You cannot close your eyes once you have been exposed to the consequences, to environmental toxins in rivers or to child labor in Asia. Economy must grow. What do you think about this sentence? That's a difficult sentence. I would like to say that not growing is nonsense. In the highly competitive textile industry, as VD, we have to grow. I cannot refuse this sentence, because at the moment in the textile industry, we are in a phase of very strong concentration. This means that both my competitors and my customers are getting bigger and bigger. If I stay small, then I'm quite vulnerable, because the bigger the customers get, the bigger the margin requirements become. And the smaller I am, the less I can oppose this. And the bigger my competitors get, the more power they have in terms of big marketing money and possibilities of influence. This means that VD must grow in order to survive in this market. That is one thing. At the same time, at VD we are also taking another path by doing everything we can to ensure that our products are ever more durable, by doing everything we can to ensure that they have a second or third life through our repair services, including rental services, through resale opportunities, through upcycling because that's the way we see our path. Yes, we want to grow as a company, but not by constantly consuming more resources, but by moving towards a circular economy, 
by offering services in addition to our products, by becoming a lifelong partner. We are, so to speak, taking both paths. We want to continue to grow in order to survive in this industry, but we want to grow in a way that is as resource neutral as possible. Wir gehen sozusagen beide Wege. Wir, wir möchten weiterhin wachsen, um in dieser Branche bestehen zu können, möchten aber ähm, möglichst ressourceneutral wachsen. Impulse. A list in an office kitchen of the German daily newspaper Taz says, we make the invisible visible. Enter yourself on the list when you have cleaned something that you haven't made dirty. Out of 20 persons on the list, 17 are women and 3 are men. Let's get back to VD. The company provides a comprehensive report on its corporate activities by using not just one, but several reporting models. It reports according to the European Eco-Management and Audit Scheme, EMAS, according to the model of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, and according to ESO 14001. And for the third time, it also uses the Common Good Balance Sheet. We talked with Jan Lorch, the responsible sustainability manager, and first asked him why VD decided to additionally submit a report using the model of the economy for the common good. Das sind ja ganz unterschiedliche Berichtsformate, die unterschiedlichen Zwecken dienen. The European Environmental Management and Auditing System, EMAS, the reporting model of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, and ESO 14001 on the one hand, and the reporting model of the Economy for the Common Good on the other hand, are very different reporting formats. Each model serves different purposes. What we at VD liked about the Economy for the Common Good model is that it has a normative component which GRI does not have, for example, because the GRI model is purely descriptive. The Common Good Balance Sheet contains an evaluation benchmark. We like to measure our corporate actions against a normative guideline that is ethically justified. We believe that this approach fits well with our company and our corporate culture. The model of the economy for the common good follows a different approach than GRI or AMAS, which, for example, focuses on energy or water management. The reporting model of the economy for the common good is much more about ethically correct corporate management, which is also evaluated. The other reporting models do not have this approach at all. Is the reporting model of the economy for the common good already familiar to other companies you deal with? Basically, our stakeholders are increasingly demanding that we are transparent and report on what we do. And we also want to be transparent. Reporting itself is already in demand. I cannot say that there is any explicit demand for certain standards or a special demand for the model of the economy for the common good. Rather, it is something that corporate reporting professionals are asking for. They know about the common good balance sheet, but they are rather specialists. There is still a lack of companies that do reporting. The Sparda Bank in Munich is a positive example, or here in the region the nutrition company Rapunzel. Both companies are well known and are already larger companies. It would of course be good if DAX companies felt committed to the reporting standard of the economy for the common good. That would probably increase awareness considerably. What could further increase awareness for the common good balance sheet? That is a good question that is not easy to answer. 
a certain exquisition activity would be good. Christian Felber has become more popular over the past few years, but it is a rough road. If, for example, local authorities at state level would recommend using the common good balance sheet, that would help. And if reporting companies would then also be relieved of tax or relieved otherwise, that would be very good, of course. And it would be very good if reporting companies would be given preference when it comes to public procurement, right? Yes, public procurement is also an exciting topic. This would of course promote awareness of the common good balance sheet. VD is a member of the so-called Textile Alliance. This is a round table at which around 130 representatives of the federal government, from industry, non-governmental organizations, trade unions and associations sit together and work to achieve social, ecological and economic improvements along the entire textile supply chain. What can you report from this Textile Alliance? VD was a founding member of the Textile Alliance six years ago. I myself spent one and a half years in the interim steering committee that helped to set it up and that drew up the basic set of rules. The steering committee meets about eight times a year. VD is active in the Chemical Fibers Working Group a group that is important for us, more important than the natural fibers group, because we produce a lot of chemical fibers. The working group meets three or four times a year. In addition, the Textile Alliance has launched various country initiatives, which, for example, deal with the production conditions in Bangladesh, India and in the future also in Cambodia. Also, there are many web and training seminars for Alliance members. Basically, about 50% of the German textile industry is represented in the Textile Alliance. You can see it as you like. The glass is half empty or half full. There are also large companies in the Alliance, such as Otto or Boss. And there are also other outdoor companies in the Alliance, such as Schöffel or Deuter. Joining the Alliance requires a baseline reporting, followed by annual roadmaps describing the goals and the measures for achieving them. In addition, the members must commit themselves to a continuous improvement process. This has caused small and medium-sized companies to either be excluded or to leave the alliance, which is a pity since small and innovative companies are particularly needed. Meanwhile, Gerd Müller, the German Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation, has drafted a law on due diligence. This law provides for human rights and environmental due diligence in global value chains for large companies, sets out appropriate sanctions and also improves access to the German judiciary for victims of human rights violations. Does this draft law also originate from the Textile Alliance or does it come from another source? Indirectly, it is a result of the Textile Alliance because we are also discussing equal opportunities for competition. We need the same rules of the game for everyone, and this law on due diligence is intended to create a level playing field for all textile companies. That is the background. However, I believe that if 100% of the textile industry were member of the Textile Alliance, this draft law would not exist. What could we from civil society do to make this due diligence act a reality? This act is highly controversial in the industry. Sure, progressive companies like us support the draft law. We consider it as complementary to the Textile Alliance's work. 
But I would say that the big textile associations and also large companies like Otto are absolutely against it. The reason for this is that the draft law is very far-reaching. It obliges German companies to assume responsibility for the entire supply chain down to the last supplier. At the same time, companies are responsible for ensuring that the last supplier in the supply chain correctly complies with many regulations, including social regulations. Companies must prepare audits and also do a risk analysis with their suppliers. If they do not do so and something happens and the company cannot prove that it has fulfilled its duty of care, it may be convicted in German courts under German law as the due diligence law also stipulates administrative and criminal offenses. It is quite a novelty that a German company is responsible for third-party companies in distant countries. And Jan Lorch, what is your personal assessment? Will this due diligence act come into force? My gut feeling tells me that the law will likely become reality. Impulse. When U.S. Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg is asked when there will be enough women on the nine-member U.S. Supreme Court, she says, When there will be nine. People are shocked then, says Ginsburg. But there were nine men and nobody ever questioned that. This brings us to the end of our program. You can find further information on the economy for the common good on our website www.ecogood.org. From the studio, Reinhard Schwarz and Andrea Behm say thank you for your interest and goodbye. goodbye.